welcome to the second panel of today's conference, What are the lessons of the 1974-75 renegotiation? My name is Helen McCarthy, I'm Deputy Director of the Myland Institute in the School of History, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for this panel, um, where we're teaming together um, two of, we, of, of, of two people who we might describe as amongst the uh, new generation of scholars working on Britain's relationship with Europe, with two, if I may be so bold, veterans of British politics. Um, so it's sure to be... <laughs> we couldn't say that about a lady, you see, it'd be politically incorrect. Well, try me. Um, so, uh, so I'm sure it's going to be a really fascinating uh, conversation. So let's start then with our speakers. Daniel Furby is a policy analyst at FIPRA, which is a Brussels-based EU affairs consultancy uh, specialising in EU economic governance and health systems reform. He has a PhD from, the, from Queen Mary, University of London, on UK, the UK's entry to the European community. And he's also published various uh, think tank publications uh, and articles. Uh, then Matthias Heusler is a research fellow at Magdalen College, Cambridge. He's recently just completed his PhD on Helmut Schmidt and Anglo-German relations. And he's got a whole sort of string of, of academic publications and a very starry academic CV. So let's hear from Daniel and Matthias first, and then I'll introduce our discussants. All right, so... Um... I'll go first because I think I'm talking a bit more about the similarities between 74, 75 and today, um, where you're going to talk more about the differences. Um, so the panel is titled, What are the lessons of the 1974-5 free negotiation? And as a historian, of course, a word of warning, we're always very careful about lessons of history. We're trained to stress the particularity of each event and so on. And I think there are some very obvious differences, of course. Um, Nonetheless, when I was doing my work on anglo german relations on the 74-5 renegotiation, I was struck by some more general parallels or rather similar patterns. Um, and what I want to do in this talk today is just kind of highlight three of them, three aspects of the 74-5 renegotiation that, that struck me in this regard and kind of reflect towards the end briefly about what they may tell us more generally about Britain's relationship with Europe. So the first thing... Um, I found um, was the obvious lack of a clear initial negotiating position in 74-75, which was, of course, due primarily to the domestic and party political origins of the renegotiations. Now, it's clear from today's perspective, I think, that the renegotiations were a sort of ploy by Wilson to appease the anti-European wing of the party in opposition, while also at the same time avoiding to commit himself personally against withdrawal in principle. And correspondingly, the renegotiation demands listed in Labour's election manifesto in February 74, were written primarily to appeal to the party rather than with a view on their actual relevance or obtainability in Brussels, which unfortunately meant that with the surprise victory in March 74, um, Wilson suddenly actually had to deliver such a renegotiation, and nobody seemed to be quite sure what exactly that renegotiation would entail or how to achieve its demands. And in this regard, there was quite an interesting the early exchange in a meeting of the new Foreign Secretary James Callaghan with British ambassadors to key EC countries, which I think reveals quite well the flair of the initial policy making. Um, I'm just going to quote you a bit from that exchange. So Callaghan told the ambassadors, at the first reading, note the first, at the first reading of the Treaty of Accession, he found it difficult to see how we could achieve our objectives on agriculture and the budget without amending it, but this needed further study. He understood the Treaty of Rome was considered to be so flexible that it permitted almost anything. Yes. Yet when the assembled ambassadors, as well as uh, Sir Michael Palliser, told Callaghan the treaty change was very unlikely to be obtained, Callaghan suddenly decided to reveal that the actual terms of the renegotiation did not seem that to matter that much. Indeed, he personally professed to be more curious. Um, he personally wanted to know what sort of Europe the other members were aiming at. It was very important for people in this country to know whether the community was serious about economic monetary union and European Union. If these items could be left out of the account, it might be possible to do a deal on such matters as at the common agricultural policy and the budget. Many of its difficulties would then be swept away. So I think we can already see some, some sort of dynamics here, an agenda that's originating primarily from domestic politics and party management, sort of lack of initial strategy on how to achieve this agenda, and also a first indication uh, in the final part here, that the actual negotiations were not seen as really decisive for the referendum. Now, which brings me to my second point, uh, which I called um, unclear aims lead to ambiguous diplomacy. 
And it is here where I kind of want to focus on the Anglo-German dimension for a bit. Now, initially, the Germans were quite, they adopted a rather uncommitted wait-and-see attitude, sort of appearing sympathetic to some limited changes while categorically rejecting any treaty change or sort of more general uh, change to the decree. Um, but during the course of the renegotiations, the Germans actually became increasingly skeptical about British intentions. In particular, they came to worry about Harold's, Harold Wilson's personal uncommitted stance, since Wilson continued to insist that he had not made up his mind yet and that his own position would be entirely determined by the renegotiated terms. Now, we now know, of course, that this simply wasn't true. Um, at the time, however, Wilson seems to have played his role as the sort of uncommitted fighter for British interests rather too well. I think this is something that becomes evident when looking at the Anglo-German talks at Chequers in late November 74. Now, whatever the positive effects of the meeting on the British side, and there's been quite a big deal written about this, the Germans actually seem quite dismayed afterwards. Indeed, the German record notes that Wilson seems interested in Britain remaining a member of the EC, but without strong involvement, uninformed about details. They also complained that Wilson had shown no readiness to publicly declare the wish to remain inside the EC before final renegotiation results were known. Now, for the Germans, this came to be the key problem, since the Germans, somewhat paternalistically, I suppose, believed that Wilson's personal stance would be decisive in determining the outcome of the referendum. So they thought that if there was a strong lead and sufficient political will on the highest level, this would sway public opinion. The absence of this lead, in turn, increased the doubts about the real motives behind the renegotiation, and thus about the British government's more general ultimate intentions and attitudes uh, towards Europe. And these suspicions, I think, were helped by the fact that the meeting again revealed the, the contradiction between the excessive focus on the renegotiated terms in public and the actual irrelevance of these terms in reality. For example, when Callaghan asserted during the talks that what happened in the, re in the referendum would depend not so much on the results of the renegotiation as on the atmosphere and situation at the time, the German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt was very quick to jump on these off-the-cuff remarks. Schmidt said he had understood the Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary to imply that in many respects psychology mattered more than the detailed fine print of the negotiation. If the psychological needs were of that weight, however, the British government might want to ask themselves whether they were proceeding psychologically prudently in filling in the needs only step by step. I think this, in effect, meant that Schmidt had called the British bluff. Namely, that the renegotiation wasn't really about the terms, but rather a tool for managing an incredibly, incredibly challenging domestic scene. But British diplomacy made, did lift to make this clear to its European partners. So for Schmidt, of course, this meant that um, he increasingly came to see the negotiations as something as a kind of sideshow, fought for the reasons of British domestic politics and distracting him from, you know, saving the world, which is car, and, and so on, and the oil crisis and whatnot. Which, but why was this the case? Why did Wilson, even though he clearly wanted to keep Britain inside the EC from the very start, independent of the renegotiation, why, why did he cling on to the renegotiation exercise? This brings me to my final point, which is the ability to deliver. Now, though it seems clear today that Wilson wanted to keep Britain in Europe from the very beginning, he obviously felt too constrained domestically to actually say so, clearly believing that he needed to do some shadow boxing first. The Germans, however, did not really grasp the extent of Wilson's domestic constraints and therefore increasingly tried to push him into a personal commitment to continuing British membership. Now, this was, of course, essentially a chicken and egg problem. The Germans wouldn't move until Wilson moved, but Wilson wouldn't move until he had received better terms first. Um, so the British and German needs were sort of directly at odds with each other, and this is something that became particularly evident in the run-up to the decisive European Council in Dublin in March 75. Already a month before, for example, one of Schmidt's key personal aides, uh, Hans-Jürgen Wyschnewski, told the British that Schmidt would want to show great readiness to help the UK over the renegotiation terms, but he should also want to get some further assurance from the Prime Minister, perhaps in restricted session, that he was prepared to throw himself wholeheartedly behind the new terms in submitting the issue to the people in the referendum. Yet such hopes were again illusory. Callaghan even claimed immediately prior to the Council that Wilson would not even give his private assurance that he would push, push through a successful negotiating outcome, as such an assurance would eventually become public and negatively prejudice all hopes for a positive decision in Cabinet, majority of the party, and Parliament. Now, all of this, of course, we now know, was done by the British with a view of actually winning the domestic arguments. The side effect of it, however, was that it increased German doubts over the British government's eventual ability to deliver even further, 
which is, of course, why they decided to minimize German concessions to preserve the sort of accrued commutaire and to actually coordinate a secret Franco-German negotiating position prior to the Council. So to return to the sort of theme of the panel, lessons from 1974-75, um, there, there, there's some, I think, obvious visual communication, there's some ob obvious differences. Um, but um, I think I've highlighted three points, which though obviously not identical, seem to somewhat reflect the current state of the renegotiations. First, just like in 74, there seems to be quite a lot of confusion today about what the UK actually wants to get out of the renegotiation. So we again have a very unclear initial negotiating position. Second, just like in 74, British diplomacy seems unclear and ambiguous. It's still not quite clear how Cameron actually wants to achieve his aims. Does he want treaty change? Does he not? So on. And finally, just like in 74, there are increasing doubts amongst other EU members whether Cameron will actually be able to deliver on the referendum, even if they grant him some sort of concessions. And in this regard, there's actually quite a telling quote from the former German Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer in January 2013, which I think still summarizes informed German opinion quite neatly, where Fischer wrote, Cameron's strategy is the product of two illusions. First, that he can ensure a positive outcome, and second, that the EU is actually able and willing to give him the concession that he wants. So to kind of, so conclude, um, it may be worth asking why these two episodes, more than 40 years apart and taking place in a very different historical context, nonetheless seem so similar. Um, fundamentally, I think, uh, this is because the renegotiations are essentially a symptom of a more general British reluctance to have a clear, all-out open debate about the country's future international and European role and its more general relationship with Europe. So the, the largely artificial debates over the exact terms of British membership are symptom rather than cause of, of the country's troubled relationship with the EU. As I hope to have shown, the renegotiations in 74 were essentially shadow boxing for domestic consumption, which is something that was clearly picked up by the, German, by the Germans and the Britain's other partners at the time. Um, so I suppose if there is a lesson from history that can be drawn from the episode, it is this. Um, if Britain really wants to settle the European question, it probably shouldn't do a renegotiation first. And if the British government really wants to remain an EU member, which I think is something that the top level of, of the current government still does, it probably shouldn't continue to sidestep the bigger debates about sort of British identity and the country's international role by conducting an essentially meaningless renegotiation on the backs of the EU and its member states at a time of much more pressing global problems. Because as the case of 74.5 shows, I think this is likely to only lead to an erosion of trust, even though it may perhaps work out well domestically in the short term. Uh, leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Matthias. Great visuals. So <laughs> it's now uh, Daniel Furby is going to continue. Okay, so the theme of this presentation, uh, slightly in contrast to Matthias, is difference, difference between uh, 1974, 75, uh, and today. In this sort of prompted by the media debate around the current renegotiation and referendum and the tendency to always point out the parallels and a sense that I had that there are important differences and it's worth uh, reflecting upon these and drawing attention to these. Uh, of course, there are striking similarities and this can highlight uh, continuities in Britain's relationship with Europe over time, but also highlighting the differences can lead us into an interesting discussion about change over time in UK-EU relations. So I just want to um, briefly highlight some of the differences relating to the origins and substance of the renegotiations, uh, then in relation to the wider context in which they're taking place, and then finally uh, talk a little bit, highlight some themes about change over time in UK-EU relations. So I start with this slide, uh, not to make any profound point, but just to remind ourselves that the, the nature of the renegotiation, the Europe that Britain is negotiating with, is very different, both uh, in 1974, 75, and today. And the membership is just the most easy way of illustrating this, but there's many more profound, deeper changes about the nature of the organization peers referred to earlier on. So it's important to keep that in mind as you think about uh, this renegotiation. So coming to the origins, um, and, of course, there's a lot of scope for interpretation about exactly how Wilson and Cameron reached uh, the de decisions that they did. But I think there's two important distinctions that whatever interpretation you take are worth 
highlighting. And the first is that uh, Wilson was in a position in 1971 where he was obliged to take a position on the UK's membership of the European community. The negotiations had reached a conclusion. The Labour Party's policy at that time was entry on the, the, if the terms were right. He now had to make a decision about whether those terms were right, and he was doing so in a context where the opinion within the Labour Party was moving progressively in a more hostile direction towards the European community. Um, in Cameron's case, there was no moment of decision in the same way as it was for Wilson. They could have continued with the policy of the government at the start, which was only to have a referendum in a context where powers are transferred from uh, Britain to Europe. Uh, domestic considerations, the, the strength of UKIP, how far back uh, the Conservatives were in the polls at that time, uh, pressure from inside the Conservative Party intervened to, to change uh, Cameron's thinking. Another important distinction uh, to make relates to uh, what actually the strategy was. So for Wilson in 1971, the, it, the initial strategy was simply renegotiation. We often think of Wilson's strategy as being identical, renegotiation referendum, but referendum only came later for Wilson. Uh, for him, the point was to find a fix to the issue of terms that the Labour Party could find acceptable. For Cameron, um, it has been from the beginning, at the centre of the Conservative government's strategy, that it's fundamentally about referendum. and Renegotiation seems to have been designed as a way to uh, enable Cameron to advocate for continued British membership uh, come the referendum. So now coming on to the substance, and a couple of uh, distinctions again to make. Uh, here's the European Council. It hasn't changed too much. You might if if you could see, the seating was a bit more comfortable in the 1970s, but this is still the central forum where decisions uh, will be made. Um, on the substance, again, there's important distinctions to be made. So on the presentation, the Wilson government it was clear at the outset what they wanted to negotiate about. It was essentially the terms of entry, issues like the budget, uh, imports from uh, New Zealand, New Zealand dairy products, uh, Commonwealth sugar. With the Cameron government, it's been very vague. It's, it's only recently started to become much clearer. So um, when Cameron gave his January 2013 Bloomberg speech, he set out a set of broad principles which would guide his uh, relationship, uh, guide his negotiation with the European Union. Uh, those were things like flexibility, uh, fairness, um, that power should be able to flow both back from Brussels uh, and not only from the member states to the European Union. Um, but these were very vague, broad principles, um, and it's only recently become clear what uh, the negotiation is going to be about. And that leads us on to what it is about, and the important distinction here is over the level of ambition between uh, the two negotiations. For the Wilson government, it was ultimately a fairly limited set of issues. Uh, they were annoying for the other governments to have to respond to this again, but it, they were fairly distinct, limited deliverables. In the case of the Cameron government, they've set out a much sort of broader, more ambitious set of goals, for example, on uh, safeguards for the euro outs versus the euro ins, uh, for an exemption for Britain on, on the principle of ever closer union. Uh, and, and the reason this is ambitious is not, I mean, it sounds sort of simple-ish, but the reason it's uh, ambitious is because ultimately, if it's give, to be given legal underpinning, um, it will, will require treaty change, and treaty change is certainly not going to happen before a referendum, and it's not going to happen uh, probably any time soon, given the current uh, mood within the European Union. Um, and just speaking of ambition, one other issue to mention is, of course, benefits for people coming, EU citizens coming from other countries to Britain. Uh, so this is, of course, very ambitious because of the sensitivities it raises with other member states, particularly in Eastern and Southern Europe. It would also raise sensitivities in the European Parliament, as I'm sure our MEP colleague uh, can testify. So now just coming on to uh, differences in the wider context. Um, Nicholas Spreckley, who is the head of the, the European Department in the Foreign Office, who wrote the report on the renegotiation and referendum of 1974-75, uh, spoke about the sense of living in dangerous times uh, during that period. And, and the point I really want to make is that if I, for those who are in Cameron's entourage, Cameron's circle, I think that sense of dangerous times is probably even more pronounced 
uh, today. So one reason for this is when they are conducting the renegotiation, Wilson could have looked around and thought, when it comes to the referendum, who will I have to support me when I go out and make the case? In fact, he would have known that he wouldn't have even, even need to be in the lead in making the case because he had the man who took Britain into the European community, Edward Heath, uh, the leader of the Liberals, who was very popular at the time, Jeremy Thorpe, uh, and Roy Jenkins, who, who would do the bulk of the advocacy for the sort of Labour Party pro-Europeans. When Cameron looks around, it's questionable. Who does he see prominent politicians that are going to support him? It's much more likely that Cameron will have to take the onus of being out in the lead in making the case. The second issue, which is very different today, is the way immigration has become so interlocked with the European issue. Um, Enoch Powell, who was the sort of figurehead for both these issues in the 1970s, didn't have the luxury of being able to conflate the two. Um, today, it's very different because of the enlargement of the European uh, community and the union and the rights that have been given to migrants coming from other European countries has meant that immigration has become interlocked. And as you can see here, actually, this was just before the current general election, this uh, sample of public opinion and what are the issues that are most important to people. And immigration is actually of significantly more <laughs> concern to people than the European issue is. So sort of by adding this extra toxic element to the European debate, uh, it's created a more difficult um, scenario come the, come the referendum. And then finally, it doesn't mean it's been mentioned a few times already, but you know, say the referendum goes against, the British government will wake up uh, the morning after with a very difficult situation. It will firstly have to sort out the UK's relationship with the EU, and on the other hand, it will probably fairly imminently face uh, pressure for a second <coughs> referendum on Scottish independence. So how does this lead us into a, a broader and perhaps even more interesting discussion about change over time in UK-EU relations? Uh, so the first theme that's been touched upon, doesn't really need me to spell it out, but is the um, shift from the prevalence of Euro uh, scepticism on the left of British politics to it being on the right. Um, with my historian hat on, I would say that the literature at the moment on the sort of underpinnings of this shift and why it took place, the, the deeper reasons for it, isn't very eloquent. I think there's a lot of work to be done on it. And reflecting on that issue can perhaps offer us some interesting insights into the potential for change uh, future change in the structure of British domestic politics, how that might impact on the UK's relationship with Europe in the future. Perhaps the most obvious example there would be further devolution to Scotland could have significant implications for the way uh, the UK's relationship with Europe might evolve. Secondly, the uh, evolution in a small c constitution of Europe. One of, aspect of that is the membership, and we've seen in a way that enlargement to the east has brought the issue of migration to the forefront of uh, the domestic debate in Britain about Europe. Uh, another issue I would highlight, uh, again, uh, referencing our, our European Parliament colleague, is the increasing power of the European Parliament in the internal workings uh, of the European Union. It was brought to the fore uh, very sort of dramatically with the um, appointment of President Juncker as the President of the Commission, uh, which Cameron was out on a limb in opposing. Uh, one could look into the future and imagine, not that it necessarily will happen, but what if the Parliament were to veto uh, the EU-US trade agreement, TTIP, the ructions that could create within in the British domestic debate on Europe. And finally, it's been talked about again, and it is a, a hugely important topic and one uh, <laughs> that there's a lot to be said about, but is you know, the gradual emergence of you know, in reality, two tiers in Europe. There is, with the emphasis of the economic crisis, Euro area integration, um, that's given much greater stimulus uh, to thinking about the future of the Euro area. Alongside that, you see in the renegotiation demands of uh, Cameron's government a, a big concern about the relationship between the Euro ins and the outs, the safeguards um, that would be in place for the Euro outs. The membership of the Euro ends should be kept in mind has expanded uh, significantly in, in recent years and is likely to continue to do so. So Britain's place on the out will become even more distinct. And it just offers us one final thought when we talk about you know, being an EU member. What we primarily talk about here in Britain is being part of the single market. But we have to remember for most other European countries, the EU membership is much more than just uh, the single market. So... 
uh, just to highlight some of the, the differences, distinctions between the, uh, the 70s and today, and to think about uh, how this opens us up into a broader discussion about change over time. Thank you, Daniel. So we now have our two discussants, Bernard Donoghue, who uh, uh, has been a member of the House of Lords since 1985, and for a decade before that, he was head of the Number 10 Policy Unit under Harold Wilson and James Callaghan. And I'm sure you're all familiar with his many uh, writings, including his two volumes of his Downing Street diary. Uh, Tom McNally uh, entered Parliament in 1979 as a Labour MP for Stockport, Stockport South and became a member of the SDP in 1981. Before that, he had been political advisor to the Foreign Secretary James Callaghan and then in 1976, becoming head of the Prime Minister's political office in Downing Street when Callaghan replaced Harold Wilson. And he's been in the House of Lords since 1995 uh, and became leader of the Liberal Democrats there. Um, from two, from in 2004 to 2013, uh, and was also a minister in the coalition government from, two, from 2010 to 2013. So they're going to speak each for about five minutes or so uh, in response to the papers, and then we'll open it out, and we should have plenty of time for questions and discussion. So, Bernard, would you like to kick us off? Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> yes. Just say something from 1973 to five why we had a referendum, uh, and that it was a device for Wilson in terms of party management. It had first been proposed by Tony Benn, who was on his rise to uh, uh, seek the party leadership, and who was fighting the anti-European cause. The background was that Labour had been fatally split uh, in the 1973 vote on accepting entry into Europe, with Roy Jenkins, the deputy leader, resigning and basically taking about a third of the party with him, uh, not out of the party, but voting against. So coming up to the election, Wilson needed to unite the party, and the issue was how did he fight the election when the European issue came up, and the referendum gave him a marvelous way out, because he said, we agreed, we'll have a referendum, and everyone agreed on that, so there was no uh, real need to have uh, battles during uh, the campaign. Wilson's own position was not one of principle, he didn't uh, have, on the whole, deep principles, and was very concerned about people who did, who he called theological, which for him was a very denigratory term. Uh, and when, uh, after the referendum vote, I saw him, and I asked him how he voted, because it was typical of Harold, you could work for him day by day, but not have a clue, in fact, how he might vote. And he said, oh, of course, I voted to stay in. And I said, why? And it was nothing to do with the negotiations or anything. He said, well, coming out would put the wrong people in power, like Ben and Powell, who he linked as being both swivel-eyed. Um, and so that basically was Wilson's position. He also thought it was actually in the United Kingdom's interest to stay in. Uh, he thought it would keep the party together because he could hold the cabinet together on that because he knew Ben wouldn't in the end leave. Ben, although a great man of principle, would never resign on anything because he wanted to stay in office. But he knew Jenkins and the right-wing theologians would, like with Shirley Williams and so forth, would, would resign. So that would keep uh, the party together. The negotiations mattered. He wasn't completely cynical because he knew he had to be seen to achieve things for British interest. So he had to be fighting for Britain. That was a good uh, political position. I've never forgotten in the middle of the negotiations, I was once in the study with him and he was cursing 
the French, as usual, uh, and for their position on a certain budgetary issue, which we couldn't resolve, uh, and so forth. And we were having big battles with them, and he was fighting them and cursing them. And I went off to the policy unit, and I had some very good people in the policy unit, and uh, Andrew Graham, later Master of Balliol, and Gavin Davis, uh, later Chairman of BBC, um, uh, they were two of my economic advisors, so it was quite good in there. And we spent all day thinking about this issue, and in the end, they got a way around it. And they said, we've got a solution, and they wrote it out, and I dashed up to the study, and he was in there with Jim Callaghan, actually, talking about it. And I didn't wait, I was so excited, I knocked and went in, and I said, Harold, on this budgetary issue, we've got the solution, and I handed it to him, and he looked at it, and his eyes looked puzzled, and he looked up at me, and he realised I was how naive I was. He said, Bernard, I don't want a solution, I want a grievance. <laughs> and so Wilson was a different kind of uh, political animal. But so that was the, the referendum background. You refer to Schmidt, uh, and Schmidt was very important and we could see Schmidt's concerns. But in their private talk, they came to the deal that Wilson would uh, come out in support of staying in, which was Schmidt's concern. And in return, Schmidt would deliver for Britain some amendments to the budgetary mechanism which would help Britain. And that was agreed there, and that was finally delivered in the Dublin summit in, in March, and that was, that was in real terms important for Britain's budgetary situation, and it was important uh, politically. So that deal uh, mattered, and Schmidt was very, very important to the Labour Party because there was great respect uh, for him. And when he spoke at conference, it was very moving. Now, just a few words on whether we draw conclusions. I think you should be very careful about that. As has been said, in the 40 years, much has changed. Uh, Europe's changed, uh, moving much more towards financial and political union, which we never voted for, much bigger, of course. Also, I think, less attractive, because Europe is now full of problems. It's easy to forget, but then Britain was the sick man of Europe. And Europe was very impressive economically. For 30 years, it had been growing stronger and stronger. And for many of us, we saw one way out of Britain's mess was to join this very attractive uh, uh, EEC. And their politicians were very impressive. I mean, de Gaulle had been, Schmidt was, Pompidou. I don't think they have that e uh, equivalent now. Uh, Britain relatively is stronger now. I don't think our politicians necessarily are, but relatively economically, we're not poorer, the poor man of Europe, as we were uh, then. We don't appear to need Europe to rescue us. Then you didn't have, as has been mentioned, the big issue of migration, which I think is very important. Most of the issues are really the same. They all come round. If you sit in the Lords, hear the debates, you think you're 40 years ago and looking at some of the people you certainly think uh, <laughs> you are. Um, as for the negotiations, well, they were meaningful politically, not uh, otherwise. But I said, they were a question and will be again of fighting for British interests and if you can... The Europeans can give one or two things that can be presented as such. Uh, that's the political solution. There are, seem to me, some similarities. I say the big issues seem uh, similar. I think the voters will vote pragmatically now, as they did then, not theologically. Uh, you don't now have the big theological leaders like Jenkins and Powell were then. Uh, there are one or two smaller, swivel-eyed, but not on that scale. Uh, I think the people were very influenced by Wilson and Callaghan. 
what may have offended the Europeans as being a rather pragmatic, non-passionate, non-theological approach actually attracted the public then because that's how the public felt. And they thought, oh, if two practical people like Wilson and Callaghan, having appeared to have doubts at first, which we all have, then come out in favour, that's how we feel and we'll go with them. So I think probably, again, the position of the Prime Minister, um, Cameron, how he comes out, will influence people. Uh, I, pro I think probably uh, even our, how Corbyn comes out because most sensible people will take one look at that and think about the alternatives. Um, so uh, I think the position of the political leaders matters. I suspect the polls as then at the start of the campaign will probably indicate the result, but they're more likely to confirm people's positions and influence them. And, and party politics will matter both sides will be manoeuvring for leadership positions and so on and so forth. But on the outcome, I wouldn't predict that. I'm sure it'll be closer than the 67, 67 to uh, 33 that it was then. Uh, much closer, because there's much more feeling of the antis. The antis now have a party UK reflecting that view. Uh, but on the whole, the public the British public normally uh, vote for the status quo. Thomas. Thank Thanks very much. Um, in the early 60s, I can't put an exact date to it, but I have the cartoon at home. There, were, there was a cartoon um, which was entitled Joining the Game. And the cartoon was of a football dressing room and the team was putting their kit on, ready to play the game. And the players were very identifiable. Uh, uh, De Gaulle for uh, uh, France and Herhart for, for Germany and various others. And at the dressing room door, it stood the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, with his cricket hat on, his cricket sweater and his cricket bat in hand. And I've always thought that that cartoon encapsulated the dilemma of the British debate, uh, not just over the last 40 years, uh, but over the last 70 years. Um, the British have always wanted to join a game that the Europeans didn't want to play. And until we resolve that dilemma, um, the, it will be a, an ongoing debate in this, you know, um, the, uh, the Atlee government didn't get involved with the coal and steel community because, as the uh, miners leader of the time, Sam Watson, said, the Durham miners won't have it. Well, there are no Durham miners today. Uh, we didn't go to um, uh, uh, Messina. Um, the Labour government in the early 60s, Hugh Gates School, talked about losing a thousand years of history. Um, I came into the scene in the late 60s when I worked in the Labour Party's uh, international department um, when Harold Wilson and George Brown uh, were s saying uh, we won't take no for an answer. Uh, after the surprise defeat in 1970, uh, we were then faced with a Tory negotiation uh, which most of the participants um, admit was very close to what the Labour government was negotiating. Um, but the Labour Party settled on no to Europe on Tory terms as a way of keeping the party together. And one of the things I would say, uh, both about Harold Wilson and uh, uh, about political leadership in general, it is not ignoble of a party leader to try and keep and hold his party together. Uh, at the time, Harold Wilson once graphically said, I've waded through shit to keep this party together. And of course, his, his reputation uh, suffered for that. Um, I don't think it's seen as such a unique problem to Harold Wilson when you look at the problem that John Major had with the bastards, as he termed them, in his party. 
or now the problems that David Cameron has uh, with a divided party. It's a difficult job. I'll leave Neil Kinnock to uh, fill in the, uh, <laughs> the details. Um, when we were elected in 74, it was, again, as in 70, rather a surprise. And the first meeting we had at the Foreign Office with the officials, I, I remember um, Jim Callaghan outlining what we were going to do about uh, renegotiation. And Michael Butler, Sir Michael Butler, as he became, um, said, but Secretary of State, I don't know how we're going to explain this to our friends in Brussels. And Jim looked, uh, this was on the Tuesday, Jim looked at him and said, Mr. Butler, then you have until Thursday to work that one out. <laughs> By Thursday, Michael Butler had come with an outline negotiating plan. Uh, and it was in the most interesting uh, exercise, and I've always thought that Michael Butler is one of the unsung heroes of the, the renegotiation exercise. And I, I think in ways you can... You can say, well, the details were never of important, but I think Bernard is right. There, were, there was a necessity to, to see if there could be uh, tweaks to um, the, uh, uh, the terms that had been negotiated. Um, I think that uh, Harold and, and, uh, and Jim Callaghan did negotiate from the beginning to succeed. I've never quite worked out why uh, the anti-Europeans um, acquiesced in what uh, was clearly uh, an ambition to succeed. They never threw um, uh, spanners in the works, Shaw or John Silkin or, or, or the other uh, anti-Europeans. Uh, um, when we came back from the Dublin summit and Harold Wilson uh, announced the success of the negotiations to the House of Commons, I always remember that Willie Gallagher, a Labour member who was no friend of Harold's, uh, just stood up and said, Prime Minister, some of us always knew you'd do it, and sat down, and the house just <coughs> burst into laughter. Um, there was always a feeling that William w Wilson had cunningly manoeuvred the party um, through to a position uh, where he could get national endorsement with party unity. Um, unfortunately, it didn't last very long because the next election was, was fought on Britain withdrawing from Europe. On the negotiations themselves, just um, uh, looking on the um, origins of the referendum, Bernard is right, um, it was proposed. I was at the National Executive when T Tony Benn couldn't find a seconder for his proposal for a referendum. The view in the 1970s, certainly in the Labour Party, was that uh, referendums were things that were held by right-wing dictators, not by parliamentary democracies. Something that I've not changed my views on since, but that's another, another, another debate. But Jim did say at the time, that's a lifeboat we might all have to climb into one day. Uh, and so that proved. Uh, one other thought is that Helmut Schmidt has been mentioned. There is another dimension. I remember uh, Helmut Schmidt with Jim, quite alone, talking about this. Hold on, but for me. Uh, uh, and he, he said to Jim, he said, you know, we need you in Europe, Jim. He said, we Germans are not very good when we're on our own. We need you to make Europe work. And I think that that was very much the motivation of the Germans at that time. Whether they still have that feeling about us or, or that priority of not being left alone to try and make Europe work, uh, I don't know. I, my great worry is that the, referenda, the referendum when it takes place will be a referendum about immigration uh, rather than about the, the wider issues. Um, it, it's always a, a dangerous option, and I think it's more dangerous now than it was 40 years ago. Thank you very much.
Um, Daniel and Matthias, is there anything you'd like to respond to specifically from the discussants' remarks? Or we can go straight to the floor. I, two points, just very yeah. brief. Um, I, I find that was fascinating. Um, the, the, the point you made about the, the renegotiations went meaningless, they, they were actually important, or at least it was important that they were seen as being important. Um, I think that's something that can be pulled off once, but I don't think it works today, um, because people won't buy it a second time, because there's the precedent of 74, 75, it's still very prevalent in debate, but also because, as you also alluded to, the domestic scene is so different, and 74, 75 being the establishment was fairly united, the entire press was pro-European, anti-Europe was very much seen as a kind of pro pal pro ben kind of vote, um, and today it's, it's, it's very different. I, th I think that's, that's a very different domestic scene. Um, the other point about Schmidt, definitely wanted Britain in. Absolutely, I think this com comes across very, very clearly that the Germans really want Britain in. The question is, what, what do they kind of sacrifice for it? And what, what do they feel they're able to sacrifice for it? And I'm, I'm sure Merkel wants Cameron in for you know, free trade or not. But the question again is, what would Germany actually sacrifice? The Franco-German relationship, probably not. Um, many other things, especially if, if Britain is still seen as kind of wavering and so, sort of un, unable really to, to deliver domestically. So I think um, these were just two points I wanted to mention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're right. um, I guess there's one uh, <laughs> small uh, point that historians may be interested, uh, others may not be, but <laughs> worth making the point that, um, you know, in origin, of course, it was not about the substance really of the terms, but actually. Uh, on the budget contribution, this was a serious issue for the British. And when the Heath government negotiated entry, they were aware that there would have to be some change in the way the budget was going to work. And this is often, you know, it's retrospectively associated with Margaret Thatcher, but actually you can see it in the <coughs> negotiating briefs produced during the Heath government that they, they were always going to come back to this issue of changing the way the budget mechanism works. So it was a, a serious issue for the British. Thank you. Right, we've got about half an hour for questions from the floor. So, let's start here. Professor. Just, can you hear the back of the chat? Yeah. <laughs> a couple of questions on the differences between then and now. Firstly, I was very struck in what Tom said by what sounded like the central role of the Foreign Office. Uh, and, of course, now the Foreign Office, I've heard them go no to I wonder whether you think that makes a difference in the process of Stances on this issue might, to a certain extent, be determined by where they think you might put them in a leadership race down the line. On the, on the role of the Foreign Office, as I said, I always think that, that Michael Butler is one of the uh, unsung heroes because, because it's, he, he took um, uh, a lead in, in establishing uh, priorities, and um, the, the Foreign Office. Was I don't know whether it's kind of been battered into submission over the last four years, but but the Foreign Office was very much the 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 pro-Europe department and the Treasury as it was right through the, the, the sceptical uh, department, and it was it was there was certainly a, a, a Michael Palliser and, and a group of Foreign Office um, grandees who used their their uh, their influence uh, in in. Europe uh, constructively. So, I, yes, I, I think that the, the, the Foreign Office uh, uh, was, whether it is now, uh, I mean, it's very interesting. I can't remember what the, we called it in the coalition government, but, but the, there was that exercise that was carried out with all the departments. But the balance of competencies, the balance of competencies, which was uh, the Conservative way of proving uh, what uh, horrible encroachment had been made on our sovereignty by the wicked um, uh, EU. Uh, and uh, I think it was uh, finally put to rest just before last Christmas uh, with the general view of the various studies that had been carried out that it wasn't necessarily so. 
Could I say, yep. to confirm that, I mean, in 75, in number 10, we accepted that the Foreign Office was the centre of this. Harold Wilson accepted that Jim Callaghan led it, with, so I say, Tom having a very important role, uh, and that we were sort of watching and linking with the Treasury and basically number 10 intervening on those budgetary matters where the sceptics intervened. But the Foreign Office was central. There was a daily uh, a meeting of a committee, the key the, uh, supervising Whitehall committee met in the Foreign Office with Tom as a member. I was the number 10 member which Wilson selected, he told me, because you're the only pro-European in his number 10 team. Uh, but it was very much a Foreign Office operation and that Wilson at times blew up against what he called the Euro fanatics in the Foreign Office and in the Paris summit in, I think, February 75, I remember him summoning me to his hotel room where he stood on the bed wearing these voluminous pants and nothing else and explained to me how he had blown up the Euro fanatics in the Foreign Office. He'd summoned the top ones, I don't know if you're among those summoned, Tom, and blown them up. And he had now conveyed that to his political secretary, uh, uh, Marcia Faulkner, soon to be, Marcia Williams, soon to be Lady Faulkner, and he had conveyed that to her in order to please her as an anti-European, and the word would get out, he said, that I'm fighting the Euro fanatics in the Foreign Office. But it was the centre of it, uh, and they, they did the negotiations, and they had the resources to do it. And I think it's quite disgraceful what's been done to the Foreign Office now. Matthias and Daniel, do you have anything to add on that point about the FCO's centrality and subsequent marginalisation? The, the, the way the referendum might be in the sort of leading Conservative Party player, so that was one of the questions. I, I mean, I see your point exactly. I guess one, hard to predict the future, but uh, you can see Boris Johnson already positioning himself in a sort of a semi-skeptic position. Uh, you would think someone like Osborne, who's a pro, um, would just play little role uh, in mm -hmm. the campaign itself. It's obviously going to be damaging for anybody who wants to um, run for the leadership. But I think the general approach, probably, of the government this time will be just to try and farm it out to this sort of uh, non-party or all-party you know, in-campaign and hope that they do most of the work, make limited interventions uh, in the referendum campaign. One other point I wanted to make, you know, when talking about the party politics, because people often equate the two, 1970s and the internal Labour Party division. When I look back at what 2012 and Cameron's decision making, I, I can't see that it, twice he sort of stood down the Conservative Eurosceptics and said no to a referendum. So the question is, what changed his mind? And I don't, I don't think he's been motivated by internal Tory party ructions. It was, you know, the Conservatives were eight points behind Labour in the polls. UKIP were taking Tory voters. This sort of, the possibility that Cameron would lose the general election and he would be out, I think it was electoral strategy. It wasn't party management. So no distinction. Well, with regard to the Foreign Office, and with regard to Anglo-German relations, Callaghan, of course, plays Schmidt much more effectively than, than Wilson does. Callaghan has a much stronger relationship with Schmidt and that already surfaces during his time as Foreign Secretary um, and then continues during his time as, as, as Prime Minister. I think in 74-5, it's partly to do with the fact that Callaghan has less constraints. Uh, Callaghan works as a diplomat, essentially, in the period, so he's, much, he's more free to say, look, actually, we don't really care about the terms so much, we actually just need to get something out to show for the electorate. Wilson can't do that, because, no, I mean, perhaps it has also something to do with kind of Wilson's sort of secrecy and obsession with secrecy, that he thinks that whenever he says something, it will inevitably get leaked and then jeopardize the, the whole exercise, which is something that Callaghan doesn't doesn't feel that much, so he's much more ready to bond, I suppose, with the, the other European... Uh... Uh, Tom would know, I suspect that the... Uh, was it the International Socialist Society it was called? Socialist International. Socialist International. But Jim would have met Schmidt on that in a way that Wilson wouldn't have done, as Tom would have been there. And I, I think there was more of a personal touch. But on the coming negotiations, the reduction in the 
Foreign Office capacity and the prospect that it's left to number 10 and the auxiliaries is, is a reason for being very nervous about the Margaret Thought and a reason for the Europeans being rather nervous about who they're negotiating with. One important factor in um, 74, 75 is that by that time of their career, Jim Callaghan and Harold Wilson worked extremely closely together. Jim was deputy leader of the party in all but name. They, Bernard will remember they had a, a Friday morning meeting together. Um, they both knew that on this they either hung together or they would be hung separately. And um, that w reinforced the, each other. Jim never ever said to me, I'm negotiating to stay in or don't you worry, I know you're a pro-European and I'm going to succeed on this. Um, he always played it absolutely straight uh, as, far, as far as the negotiation. One historic document uh, was uh, that uh, I helped draft was a letter to the Labour Party General Secretary, Ron Hayward, which set out to reassure the party that we were negotiating in earnest. And this document uh, was put in fairly blunt terms uh, and the Europeans being tender souls, it caused all kinds of uh, flutterings around the chancelleries of Europe. And thereafter you would be sitting at, at a Europe meeting and if you didn't have your headphones on for translation, suddenly you would hear some, uh, in a foreign language, uh, a string and then, dear Ron, and uh, you'd realise they were uh, quoting from the Dear Ron letter. We, we, uh, but but they, that, they, they did, we did set out a, a set of, of, of terms, and the white paper at the end referred back to those terms. Uh, and of course, journalists, academics, etc., are, um, by the nature of their trade, slightly cynical about the politicians. But as an exercise, I, I think. It worked extremely well, both in keeping Britain in Europe, keeping the Labour Party together, uh, keeping that government together, uh, uh, which isn't a bad set of ticks for any political and exercise. And as a political challenge, Tom, remember, it's often forgotten that at the start of this, in the Labour movement, a majority of the party in the country was against staying in, a majority of the TUC was against staying in, a majority of the parliamentary Labour Party was against staying in, and a majority of the cabinet was against staying in. So the challenge for Wilson and Callaghan to hold the party together and produce a yes vote was an enormous challenge, and it's a huge tribute to them that they delivered that. And what the referendum gave them was a way of mobilising the country majority against the party majority. All right. Uh, they were bloody well advised, though, weren't they? Oh, thanks. I <laughs> right, I think we'd better move on to our second question. Tim Bale. Uh, yeah, um, it actually comes off the back of what Bernard said. Um, we obviously know that the eventual result of the referendum was a fairly overwhelming win um, for the, the, the in-campaign. Um, but we also know that actually opinion in the country... Um, you know, some months uh, and certainly years before that um, was, was far more sceptical than that result would um, suggest. Um, so that, that prompts two questions for me. One is, um, what was it that gave Wilson and Callaghan and those people doing the, re the renegotiations the confidence that they could kind of turn public opinion as well as party opinion around? Um, I'm not so sure that um, politicians these days, with so much more access to kind of public opinion polling and research, would have been quite so confident. And then the, the um, second question is, um, how big a win would have been good enough? Okay, would 51-49 have been okay, um, or did it have to be um, overwhelming? Who'd like to start? Well, 51-49, <coughs> yeah, one would have been enough. One. But 95... Five wouldn't have been enough for the Eurosceptics. Uh, and I've, one of the things we've got to face is that after the next election, uh, ele I was listening the other day to David Stoddart, Bernard was saying, right, if any of you want, go and have a look at the debate in the House of Lords now. Uh, I mean, it, it really is uh, a trip down memory lane. 
with David Stod dear old David Stoddart there still saying that the um, uh, 75 election was a fix and nobody knew what they were really voting for and the government would conceal the real intention from the people and it'll all be there again. The division is there and, and in a way the, the referendum will not settle that. You're not going to get John Redwood uh, the day after the referendum saying, oh, I now understand and I accept. <laughs> I can make a point to Tim. Although it's true that earlier the public was sceptical, if you look at the opinion polls, we did take the opinion polls. I mean, Maury uh, Bobblester regularly reported to me, and I kept them all until recently I threw them away. But by the start of the campaign, the majority was fairly firm, and the polls didn't change much, the campaign didn't alter much, but you're right, somewhat earlier, there was a large don't know element, and that don't know element seemed to have moved fairly firmly across, perhaps because they were offered a referendum. <coughs> I think a referendum helped a lot to people think, well, at least we're being consulted. On the opinion polling, there's one little footnote, uh, Roy Hattersley, and I were uh, charged with, with getting some opinion polling and we decided we'd use foreign office funds to do that and uh, we engaged Bob Worcester uh, and uh, suddenly Sir Tommy Brimelow came along and said uh, that this was a misuse of public funds. So um, Hattersley and I said, oh, it's certainly not a misuse of public funds, we're, we're going to spend the money anyway. And Sir Tommy said, then, I've got to say, uh, gentlemen, that I'm going to put a note on the record that I believe that this is an abuse of public funds. And um, when the Public Accounts Committee come to look at this matter, that note will be available to them. <laughs> we don't care, said uh, Hattersley and myself, and Sir Tommy went out, and then we looked at each other and thought, we better find out, find some other way of paying for the opinion polls. <laughs> Daniel and Matthias, do you have much sense of how far public opinion is sort of more knowable in 2015 than it was back then? Difficult question. <laughs> um, worth bearing in mind, again, just as a, a point of detail that 1974 manifesto, uh, the, the option was still between referendum and general election to decide whether the outcome of the renegotiations were acceptable. So it was only, I guess, because they had to have the October 74 uh, election as well that it forced Wilson's hand that it would have to be a referendum. Right, there was a, late, uh, a question there. Yes, you. The MEP again. Um, I agree with you about immigration, surprisingly. Um, I stood on platforms three, four, five times a week during the European elections. Now, everybody else knows where I stand on um, immigration. But it's getting rather polemic when it's argued in the European Parliament. And, and actually, Gisela was saying it wasn't actually argued in the European Parliament. It is. It's every single week we stand up and we argue. You've got the left and the right. Now, where Merkel's concerned on this, what's quite interesting, you've got the rise of the so-called populist parties. And each time, the right and even the centre-right stand up and say, no, we actually want to break down Schengen, etc. Merkel is arguing against it. That will be her downfall. Whether she actually wants Britain to leave, I don't know. I think because she's looking across to other borders. Now, if you look at um, Viktor Orban, Hungary's prime minister, you could call him populist. Now, he sits within the EPP, which is Angela Merkel's party. Now, he's being a good European because he's, putting, he's actually implementing Dublin, which, interestingly, lots of, uh, like Merkel, want to bring down now. So he's being a good um, European uh, 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 Prime Minister and saying, no, we've, we are actually going to put up these barriers because we can't cope. Now, the, 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 when I've stood on platforms, immigration was rarely mentioned. But what it will be fought on, which I said back in the European elections, it will be fought on the jobs and the economy. And that's the argument I, I, I want to have. Mm. We've won the argument, I think, on immigration. Um, they haven't won the argument in the European par Parliament, but we've won the argument here. So I'm not quite sure where uh, Merkel will go with this. But she has got, we've all got those so-called populist parties, and I sit with them. So I sit with the, the Dutch, um, I sit with the Austrians, and they're actually winning 
in their, in their countries. You've Can I Denmark, ask you perhaps to sort of formulate your question to the no, panel? No. I'm basically agreeing with them. So you know, nothing's <laughs> no, really not. changed. But what is... What, yeah, I, I also, where um, uh, public opinion is concerned, it is, it is more informed now because you do have social media and you've only got to look at the Daily Mail, the, the Daily Telegraph, and even the, the Guardian these days where you've got the opinions coming through. So I think we have got the, the opinions now. And I think it's too... I think it's very fine to call where this election will go. So the two politicians, I agree with you, but do you see, do you agree that this is too fine a point to call and let's hope that we can actually call it on e economical and jobs grounds rather than immigration? Well, yeah, but what, one of the things that I hope as well is that uh, although it, it, it's been brought together by um, the, the British uh, uh, commitment to a referendum, Nobody doubts that Europe is in need of reform. And I would have thought that um, for Mrs Merkel and others, even if they have to blame the Brits for doing it, they should seize the opportunity to try and carry through some fundamental reforms in the EU uh, for its own sake, not to appease the British. Uh, and it's as good a time as any to try and get through uh, a reform program. Um, on the, 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 this, the question of the free movement and, and that, it, it is just uh, the, the, the issue of, of uh, the Middle East on our doorstep, uh, uh, the instability there. I mean, my worry is just how outside the, the solution to some of these problems, Europe is. I mean, the, the, my dreams of, of Europe uh, 40 years ago is that by now we would be playing a significant part in, in uh, security and stability, uh, whereas we're watching. And I, I certainly wouldn't like to be outside uh, a disintegrating Europe uh, with uh, a Russia which seems to uh, be increasingly nationalist in, in, in its views, with an unstable Middle East, uh, uh, with, with a North Africa in, in shambles. It, it's, it, it's a whole lot more dangerous a world to fly solo than it was 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I share Tom's views on that as a strong European. Uh, I hope they take this opportunity to reform themselves because they really should. Uh, and I'm worried very much about the disintegration. On how close to call, yes, I said it will be much narrower. How much narrower, I simply uh, don't know. But I would counsel against saying the immigration migration debate is over and closed. It isn't. Among ordinary people, it's still a strong issue. Four million of them voted for UKIP only a few months ago. And that was partly because the main parties, especially my Labour Party under a, a, a totally inadequate leader, closed that debate and didn't discuss it. If you don't discuss it in the main politics, people will discuss it as they were in the pub and then they will rebel. So we have to discuss it and put the constructive case, which you've put, and put in the European Parliament. But on migration and immigration, you have to face the realities of what people feel about if they feel their lives and their <coughs> homes and communities are threatened. Well, I'm not shutting down the debate. I'm just saying it's been had. I think the British public agree with UKIP and the people that voted for it. Yeah, four million have voted for it. Yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. what it has to be. Okay, thank you. Uh, Helen Parr. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I agree with you that um, it's a tremendous achievement for Wilson to keep the party together and to, to get the referendum result that he, that he wanted. But I was wondering, listening to you all speaking, whether you thought that perhaps Wilson had slightly more room for manoeuvre than maybe he felt, in the sense that he could have taken a, a, a marginally more pro-European stance the Labour left wouldn't have left the party, as you said. The referendum 
vote was quite strongly in favour, and it would have done favours for Britain's relationship with the European countries, the Germans. I just wondered, it seems to me that Cameron has a kind of choice into how he, how he leads Britain into the referendum campaign, and maybe if there, he could learn a lesson from Wilson there. Well, he probably could, but the fact is that Wilson wasn't a pro-European. Wilson was a little Englander. He said he went abroad, which he did. He bought a, a, a bungalow abroad in the Scilly Islands. And <laughs> that, for Harold, was a long way. Uh, he was a North Country, provincial, non-conformist, little Englander. He felt, really, Europe was for the Europeans. He strongly supported it for them. And he mildly supported it for us because the alternatives were worse. But you couldn't get him to speak passionately for Europe because he didn't feel it. He was a Commonwealth man. That's why the Commonwealth food and New Zealand butter and that all figured so prominently. Then he felt happy. So you couldn't get him to do that. He also had, sitting on his shoulder like a great bird to peck his neck, his political secretary who would denounce him. When we, Joe Haynes and I, fixed in his, cal in his diary meetings to go and address, really, in favour of the campaign, she intervened and went to see the secretary uh, and threatened to sack him and took them all out. So Harold didn't speak in the campaign until the last few days when we got him to speak. And he declared his support for the, the negotiations in Europe in this curious speech to the London mayors in the middle of a speech about all kinds of other local London issues. He put in, we put in for him, Robert Armstrong and I, these two sentences saying he accepted it. She tried to get them taken out, and we fought and got them kept in. But it was a big battle. I mean, I wrote a, on the day after the election, he was going to make a statement, I amended it to say we actually welcomed the result. And she was with him in checkers. And she took out the we welcome the result. <laughs> so he never welcomed the result. In number 10, we had a party to celebrate the result in the private office. And she had him in her uh, office. And he never went to the party. So getting him where we got him was quite something. But it didn't mean he was for us coming out. It was for us staying in. But you couldn't get him to be pro-Europe because that wasn't him. It's clear there is an epic film to be made <laughs> with Merle Streep as Marcia and George, <laughs> George Clooney as Bernard. <laughs> and, and I, I certainly, I, I certainly, I, <laughs> I think Danny Boyle could make the film. But uh, um, no, it, it was very interesting actually. Um, Jim never spoke on. on um, a pro-Europe platform during that campaign. Uh, part of my job uh, was to find suitable gatherings um, uh, sponsored by suitable bodies. I mean, I think the Scottish Cooperative Party um, hired the Usher Hall for him to address. And, and it, so he was out campaigning. Nobody could say he wasn't campaigning, but he wasn't sharing platforms with... Um, Roy Jenkins and, and the pro-Europe, partly because um, both Jim and, and Harold suspected that, that um, Roy had other ambitions from what came of that campaign. How did that cross your mind? <laughs> um, Matthias, I think you wanted to One jump in there. One very interesting point about the, the, the mayor speech of 7th December, whenever it was. Um, I mean, it's, it's very significant in British debate. I mean, Wilson makes a big thing out of it in his memoirs. He quotes it in full, yeah. I think. If you actually read it, it's, it starts with, really, if we get the terms we want, then yeah. we will do this. But if we do not, then our interests will not be served, blah, blah, blah. And the Germans picked it up. And they looked at the German perceptions at the time from German embassy. And they say, it struck us as decidedly neutral. It is the German perception. So Wilson probably felt he had delivered on the promise, take a statement, but it didn't come across as, a, as the kind of any of the sort of impact the Germans had hoped for, which of course is two sides of the same coin, really. About, uh, and, um, and how does Cameron compare in terms of his in instincts or the voices around him? Well, I, I, think, I think the Germans see him as slightly even more in favour of, of British membership. 
I mean, Callahan is actually very different in, in 74. So if Germans know Callahan has turned into European, or something that says the earliest December 74 in, in, in the Auswärtige Sound document. So again, it's the different roles there. A big, influ so, big, yeah. big influence on Jim was, of course, the Americans. Jim was, at, like Harold, Harold may have been a, a little Englander, Jim was at heart an Atlanticist. Uh, he believed that the, the, the real stability was for um, America to remain involved in the security of Europe and that Britain's best role was as a bridge between the Americans and the Europeans to make sure that that carried on. Lord Kinnock. Given that uh, Matthias speaks of parallels, which are evident to everybody, more so now, uh, because of the contributions we've had, and thank you for those. I'm just wondering, because these are troops who have traveled the terrain, whether Bernard and Tom have been approached in any way by the people who, for the past several months, have been advising David Cameron on his strategy. Uh, because I just wonder about the degree to which the Cameroons, not so much maybe Cameron himself, but the Cameroons, the people in comparable roles in today's politics to Tom and Bernard, uh, want their thinking to be counseled by veterans. And I use that in more deferential. <laughs> As did I. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I, just wor I was working out when I saw you there. Uh, Neil, it's uh, over 50 years ago since uh, we were together in the National Union of Students. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, I, I accept the, t the, the, the term. Uh, no, we, we haven't um, been consulted. And indeed, except in kind of academic gatherings now, I, I am the um, chairman of the uh, Youth uh, Justice Board for England and Wales. And when I was appointed, um, I had a letter from the Cabinet Office that said, uh, as part of this appointment, uh, you must um, not indulge in uh, uh, frontline politics. And uh, a Labour friend of mine said, but uh, you did that when you joined the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> uh, so no, I'm not, I'm not involved in, in, in uh, any of the ca campaigns. If I may say, no, it may be because of one's own deficiencies, but my experience is one never gets consulted. I mean, when Blair and those people came in, uh, they didn't consult anyone from the previous uh, Labour government. I inserted myself onto the Irish issue because I'd been very heavily involved in that and thought there was a chance we might get a peace settlement. But you don't get consulted, and I understand why. Uh, I mean, the one thing the people, those people lack is experience, and they find it difficult to acknowledge it. So I wouldn't expect to be consulted. But they're and all because why don't we take it to the obvious and <laughs> <laughs> Well, but you have to bear in mind that one of the main themes is how much has changed. And it may be that we are not they feel we will not be as perceptive about the new situation, and I'm sympathetic to that. I think, I think that's true. The other thing, though, I do think, uh, I remember uh, one saying to um, Jim, because Jim used to love to tell Hugh Dalton stories, and I said, you, you realise in 30 years' time, I'll be telling Jim Callahan stories. And he said, oh, no, no, no. They were all much bigger men in those days. And I, th I think there is a tendency always to look at previous generations as being bigger and, and having bigger challenges uh, th th than contemporary politicians. And it ain't necessarily so. The, the challenges are still there. And whether they're perceived as big or not, is really a matter for the historians. But at the time, um, they still have to grapple with these and have, as I say, the uh, cynicism of the academics and the journalists about their motives.
My one dissent on that is if you look in the Labour Party at the candidates in the 1976 leadership election and the candidates more recently, and the candidates in the 1976 election, as Neil will remember well, were James Callaghan, who'd been in Parliament uh, for 30 years and on a destroyer in the war and helped run a trade union and all of that. And Dennis Healy, who'd stood on the beach at Anzio and won the military cross and been Chancellor of Exchequer and Minister of Defence and in the Communist Party and so forth. And uh, Roy Jenkins, who'd been in Parliament for 30 years. And you just Anthony Crossland. go through them. Anthony Crossland, who had, had quite a role as a thinker in the party and been in the Parliament for 20 years. And Tony Benn, who, despite my own reservations about him, was a giant compared to Mr. Burnham. Uh, and you just looked through them all, and Barbara Castle didn't even stand, and she could have eaten a lot of them. I think you can make a case, especially about that wartime generation. No one's written, I think, about that. But one theme you could write was what was special about that uh, wartime generation. In, on both sides, for some reason, they were mature and adult and experienced in a way we don't have now. I've never forgotten with Jim when he was uh, uh, Prime Minister. He was doing a reshuffle, and he talked to me. He talked to Tom much more, but he talked to me a bit. And 1977, and after the IMF, I was a great fan of Dennis Healy, but I said I wondered if the Chancellor was perhaps tired, and I had thought of a younger person, and, uh, and that Dennis might sort of welcome the Foreign Office. Jim looked at me and he said, Bernard, he said, when you stood at the beach at, on the beach at Anzio, with 78s going past your ears, you can talk to me about moving Dennis. <laughs> I felt properly put in my place. Well, just one last comment on, the, on that leadership election, though. Afterwards, um, Jim Callaghan said, they were all a lot cleverer than me, but I became Prime Minister and they didn't. <laughs> Which is another lesson of politics. Thank you. Well, on that historical note, I think we'll bring this panel to a close. It's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, so let me thank all our speakers, uh, both our speakers, our discussants, and I think now it's time for lunch. Whee.